Today we discover the story of one of America's most iconic buildings, a wonder of the modern world, the Empire State Building. For nearly half a century, this grand Art Deco tower held the title of the tallest man-made object on Earth, soaring above New York's existing skyscrapers at a staggering 1,454 feet from base to antenna. And although the Empire State Building continues to hold its title as one of the largest office buildings in the world, with around 2.8 million square feet of office space, it faced fierce competition by the Chrysler Building, a fight ultimately won, but rewarded only by a decade of near vacancy. This is the story of the Empire State Building. I'm your host, Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. We all know and love the Empire State Building, boasting a grand total of 102 floors, with the secret 103rd floor reserved only for the most important of guests. The skyscraper still continues to attract millions of visitors nearly a century after it was built. These days, it's lit up with LED lights allowing up to 16 million possible color combinations, and yet it's graced by the likes of pop stars such as Mariah Carey or Tom Cruise members of the royal family such as Queen Elizabeth II, as well as your everyday Midwestern tourist. This iconic landmark is often considered to be the number one tourist destination in all of America, and has been featured in several pop culture movies, including but certainly not limited to King Kong, Independence Day, Hancock, and The Avengers. But this fandom has been a long work in progress starting all the way back in the 19th century. Through the busy streets of New York City at the corner of 5th and 33rd, right to the doorstep of one of America's biggest, if not the biggest, hotel of the era. This is the very same spot where almost 40 years later, the Empire State Building construction would begin. A plot of land seemed destined for legends. I mean, consider how unusual that is. The world's biggest hotel would be replaced by the world's tallest building. So before moving forward, let's pay some respects to the memory of the Waldorf Hotel. The original Waldorf Hotel was founded after the land's owner, William Waldorf Astor, demolished his family mansion in 1890 with the hopes of transforming the plot into the most grand hotel in the world. He commissioned architect Henry J. Hardenberg for the task, and the project was not in vain, opening three years later on March the 13th, 1893, with a total reported cost of $5 million. It quickly became a hot spot for the very top of New York's social ladder, entertaining the rich and powerful in its famed Octagon Room. The 13-story hotel featured 450 guest rooms and was also the first hotel in America to offer amenities such as room service, private bathrooms, and electricity throughout. It was so successful that it further inflamed the long-standing rivalry between Astor and his cousin, Jacob Astor IV. You see, Astor IV owned the other half of the block, and upon seeing the roaring success of the newly built hotel, he decided to demolish his own family house in order to build a competing hotel in 1897, attempting to one-up his cousin with an even taller hotel. And he succeeded. The completed hotel was 17 stories tall upon completion and was constructed by the same architect Waldorf Astor had commissioned. The rivalry continued until the two cousins decided it might be best to work together, connecting their buildings with a 300-foot marble corridor, often referred to as Peacock Alley. This nickname was created on account of the more fashionable men and women of the time who often walked up and down the corridors to show off. In other words, peacocking. This new joint venture quickly skyrocketed, and as reported by New York City architect, up to 1,500 guests registered every day in its 1,300 rooms. The hotel continued to enjoy its success until its closure on May the 3rd, 1929, due to a sale to the Bethlehem Engineering Corporation for a reported $20 million. 
Soon after the hotel closed, the plot changed hands again in 1929, this time to a newly formed Empire Incorporated, founded under a previous executive of General Motors, John Jacob Rasko. He was joined by four others, including two members of the DuPont family, along with Ellis P. Earl, and together they declared former Governor of New York, Alfred E. Smith, as head of the corporation. Astonishingly, the new group decided to demolish the legendary hotel to make way for the construction of the Empire State Building in 1930. Very much mirroring the rivalry of the land's predecessors, this project would become engulfed in competition. Competition unlike anything New York City had seen before. You see, while the Empire State Building's construction was still in the works, others were competing for the title of the tallest building in the world. The main competitors included the Manhattan Company Building, now known as 40 Wall Street or the Trump Building, and the Chrysler Building. These guys all had their eyes on the prize. In fact, the Empire State Building's aspirations to become the tallest building in the world came as seriously unwelcome news as the Chrysler Building was already duking it out for the title well beforehand. The standing drama was between Craig Severance and William Van Allen, the respective architects of the Manhattan Company Building and the Chrysler Building. The two had previously been business partners who were driven apart to a bitter split for reasons still unknown. Basically, everyone wanted the same thing to eradicate architect Cass Gilbert's Woolworth building and take the title for themselves. So as construction began, the designers of both buildings made sure to keep a careful eye and ear on the progress of the other, taking note of the ideas they were able to catch wind of in hopes of pulling ahead, whether by an inch or by a mile. According to Cowan Construction, Van Allen's vision remained more elegant throughout the process, with the inspiration for the building unchanged as a monument to Walter Chrysler's great success as a pioneer of the American automotive industry. While Severance's Manhattan Company building, despite being quite impressive, eventually developed into a desperate attempt to build as many floors as the foundation could possibly handle without collapsing. This approach seemed to work at first, because by the time that the Manhattan Company building was completed in 1930, it seemed like they were coming out on top, even managing to take the title of the tallest building in New York from the Woolworth building after surpassing it by roughly 135 feet. But this victory would turn out to be rather short-lived, as others had surprises up their sleeve. The Chrysler Building was completed to much uproar when a 185-foot-tall topper for the building was unveiled as a part of the unexpected design plan. This stunt was rather cruel as it tricked the competing Manhattan Company building designers into thinking that they had the title, even going as far as celebrating it, when in the end, the Chrysler Building, from base to spire, was 1,048 feet around 121 feet taller than its rival skyscraper. Despite this decisive battle between the two, the race to the sky had only just begun, bringing us back to the Empire State Building. In April of 1929, a new competitor had entered the ring to contend for the title of the world's tallest building. The newly founded Empire Incorporated refused to let Chrysler keep the bragging rights, and while it took more than a dozen revisions for the design to be fully completed, plans for construction finally started to move forward. The design was handled primarily by Shreve, Lamb, and Harmon, an architectural firm founded the previous year in 1929, who planned for the completion of the building to stand at 1,250 feet in total, easily surpassing the Chrysler Building. The logic of the building's construction plan was surprisingly simple. According to Thought Company, the space in the center was arranged deliberately to be as compact as possible in order to efficiently contain the vertical circulation that ran throughout the building, including things such as mail shafts, corridors, and toilets. This was then encased by a 28-foot deep perimeter of surrounding office space with fewer elevators ascending as given floor space decreased. This design allowed the tower to reach never-before-seen heights. It also came at a consequence. The building was staged around a pyramid of non-rentable space surrounded by a much bigger pyramid of rentable space. And this would not be the only compromise made. The company went to insane levels to behold their record. 
Originally, those behind the Empire State Building believed that 80 stories would be enough to claim the title. However, the Chrysler Building wound up just barely surpassing it with 81 stories. So to ensure a sound victory, four more stories were added to the Empire State Building's construction plan. Things seemed to be on track, but not long after, there was another concern voiced, or even a bit of paranoia surmounting the planners. The Empire State Building was going to be incredibly tall, but would that be tall enough? As time passed, competitiveness of the race continued to ramp up, with no signs of slowing or stopping, sparking concerns that perhaps the Chrysler Building had another trick up its sleeve. Maybe another old hidden spire trick? Who was to say that the Chrysler Building and its architects weren't just waiting for the Empire State Building to be completed to unveil another, even bigger spire that wouldn't allow it to keep its crown? This worry was solved by none other than Jacob himself, who according to Thought Company, suddenly exclaimed that the scale model he was examining at the time needed a quote-unquote hat, or the famous blimp docking station. The hat was originally designed to serve as a docking station for airborne vessels such as blimps and airships, though contrary to popular belief, no airships have ever properly docked there. One famous image from the 1930s portrays the naval airship Los Angeles supposedly docking at the mooring post atop the world's tallest building. Quite disappointingly, this image is a fabrication, as pointed out by the Air and Space magazine. The idea of docking airships at the Empire State Building was not plausible from the start, and was most likely a publicity stunt for the building's backers. Docking would have been impossible, mostly due to the violently shifting air currents that surround the mooring mast at such a height, not to mention the space and heavy lead weights needed in an open landing field environment. Airship docking would have also posed seriously dangerous risk to the crowds of passerbyers that filled the bustling streets of New York, over a thousand feet below. Furthermore, there was already a law in place that expressly forbid airship from flying too low over urban areas due to similar safety concerns. In fact, it was illegal to even get close enough to the Empire State Building to attempt a docking. That being said, two aircraft did attempt to tether to the Empire State Building before the idea was finally dropped for good. During the first attempt, the forceful and incredibly treacherous winds made it impossible to reach the peak of the building safely. The captain of the Los Angeles was reportedly so afraid of the airship being blown into nearby buildings or having its sides pierced by the pointy tops of buildings that he wasn't able to take his hands off the controls for even a moment. A second attempt was made not long after by Goodyear blimp Columbia, albeit to much better results tying up and delivering a bundle of newspapers to the Empire State Building that a worker had to catch at the very top of the building. Yet due to the fact that complete docking equipment had never been installed, most experts also disregard this attempt. Following these events, the idea of further attempts to dock at the mooring mast were completely scrapped, and the rooms meant to be used for ticketing and baggage for potential passengers were turned into a tea garden for those who made their way up to observe the gorgeous views, with the highest observation deck on the other hand being permanently closed to visitors. Some believe the blimp port concept was only a PR stunt to justify the expense needed to surpass the Chrysler building as the tallest building in the world. So now let's talk about that process, the extraordinary task of the construction of the Empire State Building itself. On March the 17th, 1930, groundbreaking in preparation of the placement of the building's foundation began. No expense in the $50 million budget was spared in securing the materials necessary to bring this titan of New York architecture to life. According to the Empire State Realty Trust, the completed building used an estimated 200,000 cubic feet of Indiana limestone and granite, 10 million bricks, and 730 tons of aluminum and stainless steel. Due to the immense size of the project, 
all new construction equipment was purchased and custom fitted to the task, and a railway was constructed at the site to move materials quickly and with less effort required on behalf of the workers. The 10 million bricks were dumped down a chute into a hopper in the basement of the structure. When needed, the bricks would be released from the hopper and then dropped into carts, which would be hoisted up to platforms then to be laid. This saved busy New Yorkers the inconvenience of street closure for storage, which was the customary practice of construction at the time. The new method of storing bricks also saved workers from having to spend immense amounts of time and effort transporting the bricks all over the construction site manually with wheelbarrows. Richmond Shreve, one of the three founders of Shreve, Lamb, and Hammond, who worked on the project, once stated that things were so incredibly efficient on the site that they once managed to build 14 and a half floors to completion in a mere 10 days. Roughly 3,400 workers were employed on the project and at generous pay rates, working at a breathtaking pace of four and a half floors a week to ensure the construction process went as quickly as possible. Immediately after the first steel columns were placed on site on April the 7th, 1930. Most workers were a mixture of European immigrants and iron workers hailing from the Conewake Reserve near Montreal. Amongst those workers were the Sky Boys, a group of fearless iron and steel workers who balanced on precarious ledges and beams, hanging dizzying hundreds and eventually thousands of feet up in the air above the city's streets by derrick lines and cable ropes as they worked on the building. The job of an Empire State Skyboy was by no means for the faint of heart, yet they made it look easy, riding into the air on top of steel beams that they directed and steered with their feet as cross pieces, as if they were putting on an aerial show for all of New York to watch in utter amazement. It wasn't uncommon for passer buyers to flock to the construction site daily, gathering around it to watch in awe as the Sky Boys soared through the air, and behind them, teams of riveters worked tirelessly at the fastening of the building's steel skeleton with burning hot rivets. The rivets were followed closely by assorted groups of laborers who completed the stonework, masonry, plumbing, and electrical work, and as they moved up to the next floors, Plasterers, carpenters, and painters would move in to complete the job behind them. This way of working was so incredibly quick and efficient that many of the lower floors had been finished already before the steel was placed for the next levels. On the other hand, this rapid speed came at the ultimate price. It's been reported that five men died during the construction of the Empire State Building. On May the 1st, 1931, the Empire State Building was finally complete, all 102 floors, including its many amenities. Like the hotel that once stood in its place, all of New York was amazed as the Empire State Building had been finished a month ahead of schedule and under the expected $50 million cost, with the latter being a discount offered by the Great Depression. The iconic red ribbon was cut during the dedication ceremony and President Hoover symbolically pressed a button in Washington DC with the building lighting up to great fanfare as actual switches inside the building turned on the lights to welcome all who gazed upon the magnificent structure. And after just a year and 45 days, the Empire State Building had managed to surpass both of its competitors, emerging once and for all as the winner of the race to the sky, as the tallest building in the world. And here is where the story takes a very unexpected turn. Despite the incredible opening that seemed to pave the way for success, the earlier market crash soon spelled what seemed to be complete and utter disaster for the tallest skyscraper on earth. Many of New York's citizens remained unemployed, which meant that despite visitors flocking to the building's observation deck, not even 25% of the office space was rented out to paying tenants in total, standing in stark contrast to the projected 50 plus percent expected prior to the stock market crash of 1929. 
The building was so empty, in fact, that New Yorkers began to refer to it as the Empty State Building, with the entire upper half of the building remaining almost entirely vacant for the majority of the 1930s. In one of many attempts to make the Empire State Building seem more popular than it was, workers were often instructed to go up to the upper floors and turn on the lights, leaving them on for hours or even days at a time to create the illusion that there were renters. And the market crash wasn't the only thing that people found discouraging about the building. Aside from the smaller sized spaces of the upper levels, the perceived swaying of the building with violent winds due to its heights may have also dissuaded potential renters. So in hopes of enticing more people to the space, the owners once again relied on varying publicity stunts. At one point, a seance was hosted at the 82nd floor in 1932, and this was supposedly an attempt to contact the ghost of Thomas Edison, as reported by History.com. It wasn't until after World War II started and America's economy finally grew once more that the skyscraper, which to that point was largely kept afloat by Raskob's own money, started to see profit and new tenants began renting out the empty floors. The technology behind the Empire State Building is also incredible. As you might imagine, supplying such an impressive structure with electricity, heat, air conditioning, and water around the clock came at a steep cost and equally steep environmental footprint. As reported by skyscraper.org, the interior was equipped with around 6,700 radiators, 2,500 toilets and sinks, and 51 total miles of plumbing pipe. Seven banks of elevators, each serving specific floors, were employed to ensure that there would not be long lines of people forced to wait for elevators throughout the building. Additionally, there was also a complex waste removal system, telephone lines were placed throughout the entire building, and a number of freight elevators were used to bring heavy furniture up to the higher floors. By 1950, both air conditioning and heating systems served every floor, which lacked efficiency considering the building's 6,500 windows. There were also occurrences of outright waste, as it was insisted by the sitting president of the building that that all lights should constantly be kept on for the Empire State Building to serve as a beacon of light and hope to all of New York. It was around this time that the Empire State Building was on the verge of losing its hard-earned title to the World Trade Center Towers in 1972, but it wouldn't go down without a fight. A proposal was made to demolish the Empire State Building's 16-story topper and replace it with a new section that would increase the total height to 1,495 feet, making the already colossal skyscraper even taller, surpassing both the World Trade Center and Chicago's Sears Tower, which was also under construction at the time. However, this idea was quickly vetoed due to concerns over the costs and the destruction of the building's iconic look. And hence, for the first time in decades, the Empire State Building let down its guard and was surpassed as the tallest building in the world. Although no longer a record holder, the Empire State Building houses around 1,000 commercial tenants, including but certainly not limited to numerous well-known businesses such as LinkedIn, Shutterstock, and the American headquarters of one of China's biggest newspapers, The People's Daily. And in keeping with the times, many steps have been taken in recent years to reduce the carbon footprint of the Great Tower. Over the past decade alone, it underwent a massive $550 million retrofit that reduced energy consumption by around 40% and introduced renewable energy around 2011. The story of the Empire State Building is incredibly inspiring, a tale of not only survival, but success. And despite its bleak opening, it was declared a symbol of vision and faith by President Franklin D. Roosevelt not only to New York citizens, but all Americans and the world alike. There are few doubts that this Art Deco masterpiece will continue to stand tall, no matter what is to come. And while it may no longer be the tallest building in the world, I'd suggest it's the most beloved. So until next time, make sure you subscribe and check out our video about Book Tower. This is Ryan Sokash, signing off.